Houdini was a, a great showman. I put him in the category of the two great showmen in, the, in United States history. P.T. Barnum is number one and Houdini was number two. I mean, people sometimes fail to realize that he was probably one of the greatest entertainers of all time. He was more famous in his time than any entertainer in our time today. No matter who you are, no matter what you do, everyone always refers to Houdini. No matter how great your stunt, people always say, like Houdini. But he wasn't the only guy at that time doing escapes. Um, he might have said he was, and he might have gone out of his way to destroy anybody else who was doing it. But there were other escape artists at the time. With uncharacteristic modesty, he even alluded himself to a performer called Latude in France, going back, I think, to 1700, who had escaped from handcuffs. And then going through the 19th century, you'd had people like the Davenport brothers, who had presented what, in a sense, was escapology, but disguised as mock spiritualism. The Davenport brothers were touring during the craze for spiritualism, a religious movement that believed that mediums could communicate with the spirits of the dead. They would be tied up with ropes and secured to the inside of a cabinet, and then when the door was closed, strange manifestations would be heard and objects would fly out of the top. The Brothers Act implied that it was the spirits who were throwing objects around. Well, young Harry wasn't uh, convinced of that, nor was uh, Theo, his brother. And they decided that the spiritualists had just simply freed themselves. So that was the genesis of the act, although Harry presented it honestly, not as a result of spiritual activity or spirit activity, but uh, as a trick. and. Uh, a demonstration of skill as well. He'd begun in a small time way as a magician at one time. He called himself the, the king of cards. He was just performing simple card manipulations along the Dime Museum parade. But then he hit the idea, wouldn't it be great to escape from handcuffs? We're talking now the late 1800s. He was performing at the bottom of the bill somewhere in the, in the worst slot. And an impresario called Martin Beck came along. Martin Beck was the chief booker for the Orpheum Circuit, one of the big vaudeville chains in America. And from that moment, Houdini moved from the small time to the big time. He sensed that here was somebody who could really catch the imagination. The next step was to come to London. In those days, the entertainment capital of the world. So the first thing he did, he went to Scotland Yard. The police said, oh, no, 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 you'll never get out of our handcuffs. But he knew, actually, that Scotland Yard handcuffs were among the easiest to get out of. And he did. The very next week, he opened top of the bill at the Alhambra Music Hall in Leicester Square. When he sensed that audiences were growing tired of handcuff escapes on stage, Houdini added a dangerous new twist to the act. He would perform it underwater. He would announce this. He would have people uh, in the papers, he would have people walking through the streets with placards saying, come see Houdini, death-defying escape. And he would jump off the bridge into the river and escape. Houdini never described the experience of an underwater escape. But we can get an idea from those who've since been inspired by the master to take the plunge. Diving into a river or a lake handcuffed is always a very scary experience. Today you can't do it. Today you just get arrested for trying. It's causing a breach of the peace, or you're, I don't know, or you're disturbing the fish, I don't know. It's very dark. Sometimes I go down as far as 20 feet underwater, and uh, I'm doing everything by feel. I can't see my hand in front of my face. I'm usually being pushed various ways by the current. Uh, but the one thing that I am aware of most of all is the cold. There are many variables one cannot control in something like this. You're really at the mercy of the elements. You could be the greatest lock picker in the world, but when you stand up on front of that parapet in the Hudson River, there's a lot of things that can go wrong. 
You don't want to die before your show. That's, that's bad form. And uh, Harry, he certainly didn't take any big chances. But the fact that you're going to jump off a bridge, manacled, and go beneath the surface of the water, you don't know what you're going to hit down there. You don't know what's going to happen. Houdini knew exactly what he was doing. When he was thrown in in a box, he knew exactly where were the doctored bolts that his man had put in the night before that he could just push out, and then he'd come up to the top. It was doctored, but it was nonetheless magic, because magic is about what you see. One of the things that Houdini did that hadn't been done before was to bring the audience onto the stage and, 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 and kind of present himself as a trust me, I'm honest trickster. They played pomp and circumstance, of all things, and uh, Houdini came marching out on stage, rolling up his sleeves. And he said in a rather squeaky voice, I'm Harry Houdini, and I can beat any man in the house. People would bring their handcuffs, and Houdini would escape from them immediately, so that it became a sort of joint act. They were trying to outwit him, so that was a very clever thing to do. He knew handcuffs was a cinch, and if they came on stage with something that wasn't quite standard, he knew how to get around that, too. One of the common stories about Houdini was that his wife would give him a kiss before he went to try the challenge, and she would have a lockpick in her mouth where the kiss would transfer to him the key that would open it. This is an actual lockpick used by Houdini in Germany. And if I were to try to pass this thing to my wife in my mouth, I think it would, I don't know if we could do it, but if I, I can't get it in my mouth unless I shove it down my throat way too big, but that was fiction. But one of the most uh, interesting lockpicks that Houdini ever made, and he made this himself, uh, there was a lock that had a key like this. Now watch as I unscrew this, and you see this comes apart completely. I can take it out. I can rearrange these in different positions to copy any combination of the lock. Now you'll say, gee, that gives you about a thousand combinations or more. However, you say, how do you pick the right one? How do you know which one to do? Houdini had some dental putty as they handle the lock and check something. They would, get an, they would get an impression of the particular key they're trying to duplicate. A piece of wire, you could use a bobby pin from your hair, uh, the innards of a ballpoint pen, anything that you can construct to go inside of the lock and essentially do the work of the key. That is what a lock pick is. And there really isn't any definite way of, of picking locks. Picking a lock is mostly trial and error. The fact that you're using real handcuffs or you're using real chain and padlocks, things that people can relate to, that makes all the difference in the world. The mail sack or the handcuffs or the chains. You know, everybody's familiar with chain. Most people have held it. They, they know its strength. And when you use those in your show, it, it adds a believability to what you're doing. Houdini said that anybody could do it with the proper training and skill. A quick example. If someone were to come on stage with six feet of rope, you might be terrified of that. But you just can't take 100 feet of rope and tie anybody with it. It's too, it's too much rope. If you cut the 100 feet of rope into pieces, you could. But people don't realize that. Houdini's real name was Eric Weiss. And he acquired the name Harry Houdini in two ways. First of all, he'd always idolized the...